1924, and the British Empire Exhibition at Wembley. One pavilion was the largest concrete building in the world. Here was everything from airplanes to marine engines and model trains. Here to show you just how it is done, 16 motor cars were put together every day. And among the locomotives, the famous Queen's Dolls House, complete down to tiny books, handwritten by such authors as Rudyard Kipling. 220 acres of exhibits, lakes and toys on which even a king might ride. That was Wembley. Here was everything you could possibly wish to see, from eastern treasures to diamond washing. From a model of King Tut's tomb to a life-size figure of the Prince of Wales in butter. A railway that never stopped. Though one visitor claimed 142 visits to Wembley, he alleges he only had enough time to finish viewing the Pavilion of Engineering. In the giant sports arena were held circuses, Wild West shows staged by Charles B. Cochran, military tattoos, even a chariot race. By July 1924, nearly a quarter of a million pounds was being spent by visitors to Wembley every day. And yet they said it lost money. The biggest attraction was the amusement park, side shows, roller coasters, and every other known device. And according to the official guide, surprises are caused by blasts of air coming up out of the floor. It's odd of this great tribute to empire that what most people recall best is something that either spanned them round or shot them across into space. But for the British, it was a rare time while it lasted. And all this while Britain was supposedly under the threat of the Red Peril. But as Parliament opened with all its traditional ceremony, the nation appeared to breathe once more after its electoral shock and took to watching the actions of its new government, if not without suspicion, certainly with less fear and trepidation. To outward appearances, there didn't seem much change. The buses still moved up and down, and there wasn't much revolution in the London season as far as any outsider could see. Ascot was, if anything, even more colorful that year than usual. If the government was going to turn that celebrated course into a collective farm, they were certainly biding their time about it. No police spies. Well, if there were, they were wearing gray toppers. One sign of change, however. Ministers of the new regime allowed taxis to drive through Hyde Park for the first time. The thin edge of some long-term political wedge Hardly. In foreign affairs, on the other hand, Mr. MacDonald did have some immediate, if small, success. With others, he was instrumental in persuading the French to abandon their occupation of the Ruhr, even without Germany continuing her payments. But no sooner had this small victory been won than he had another crisis on his hands, in the Near East. Believing that the new British government might enable Egypt to renew her long-term claim on the Sudan, King Foud adopted a more nationalistic attitude. His strong-minded Prime Minister, Zagul Pasha, insisted to the British that the Sudan become Egyptian once and for all. But when the Governor General of the Sudan was murdered, Lord Allenby in Cairo took immediate steps to safeguard Britain's position. Even a labor government wasn't going to lose control of the vital Suez Canal. This was one time that mobs of Egyptian students demonstrated to little effect. And so the Roaring Twenties continued their roaring way. Whatever the color of her government, Britain was not going to be left behind in the great drive for mechanical superiority that this noisiest of eras promoted. If the armed forces were going to be tampered with, the Royal Air Force stayed at strength, performing as usual at its annual pageant, dropping realistic bombs on realistic targets, which realistically blew up to the delight of the spectators.
and there was no change in Britain's airship program. From her mooring mast in England, the new R-33 made a successful double crossing of the Atlantic. Though admittedly, she did arrive back with her nose considerably dented after difficult encounters with violent ocean storms. And no nation could afford to pause in the race for progress. Weren't the Germans already demonstrating the first all-metal airplanes? Although as yet few realize the importance of this development, anything that a keen competitor like Germany produced must be outdone as soon as possible. For politics or no politics, aviation was the rage around this time. Anybody who could afford it went in for their own private plane. Hitch your flying machine to your car and tow it to the nearest aerodrome, there to unfold its wings and take to the air. Another do-it-yourself. No knowing what the skies over Europe might become if this kind of thing went on. To conquer the air or the roof of the world. That year found another British expedition making the long trek through Tibet to camp at the foot of Everest in order to attack that as yet unconquered peak. Among that little party in camp were two men, Mallory and Irvin, whose courage and tenacity were destined to write a never to be forgotten chapter in the history of mountain climbing. Through powerful glasses, the rest of the party watched these two as they painfully scaled the most formidable of all mountainsides. With all her terrible power, Everest fought back, and two black specks near her summit was all that was last seen of Mallory and Irvin. Who can deny that even in defeat, Britain has her great moments? <laughs> 